If we go to high school, D Dub. Now, what kind? What give us paint a picture of what you were like in high school? Um, I was a total loser, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not like a degenerate loser, right? Not like I was into all sorts of different stuff um, that I shouldn't have been. Uh, I was just kind of a dork. I was kind of a nerd. Well, we now know that nerds rule the world. Yeah. Anytime someone says their kid's really nerdy, I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> Derek Wynn, D-Dub, welcome to Super Trooper. Thanks for having me, man. Um, I always forget to do this until about five minutes in. This might be the first time I've actually remembered to introduce a guest. Uh, BBG, uh, a benefits consulting firm. Where do you say you're from? Do you say Fairfax? Do you say Northern Virginia? Virginia? Fairfax, Northern Virginia. Virginia. Greater DC coverage area. Um, and what is your official title? Today? Yeah, today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a, clients know me as a benefits consultant. That's it. You know, um, depending on what we're doing, I might be the practice leader. Okay. You know, and then in some circles, you know, chief growth officer, but it's all doing the same thing. Gotcha. Well, for the, for the crowd watching or listening, um, I said this made you uncomfortable earlier today. You're really in the top 1% of benefit consultants in the country by book size, all measurements of the business so maybe people will pay more attention if we get to some work talk we may or may not get to work talk that's cool okay um, um what do you think of gunnersville so far dude awesome i mean it's like a slice of heaven um mm -hmm. it's really funny because the the whole time i've been here i've been saying a couple of key things and one of them is it, it reminds me a lot of like small town upstate new york mm -hmm. where i grew up um but the fact that you've got everything here, and, and of course you're like, you might as well be the mayor. Uh, you treat me like insurance royalty. So it's a cool town. I really like it. Well, we'll um, we have a, a history now. Adrian and Joey Jansen from 212 have already booked their second July 4th weekend with their family here and are looking for a place, actively looking for a lake place here. Jackie uh, Crane Power, um, Benefits, Texas. Just talked to she and her husband, Mike. They were here recently. They were like, seriously thinking about a second home here. There's somebody else. Britt, can we think of anybody else who said that they might be... Oh, people in the True Team talk about it all the time. Um, and I told Val, a.k.a. Miss Hot Dog, my wife, um, like, we, we can't ever leave now. Yeah. All the, we're going to attract all these people or be part of the charm of Gunnersville really gets them. Maybe we're a little bit additive. But... I would expect a visit from you and the family sometime in the next, say, 24 months. I'm in. Okay. Yeah, I would come back. I, I think it's cool town. So let's, I'm going to jump childhood. Little Derek Wynn. So I'm talking about like your first memories, okay. which typically go like five, six, seven, like that. What was little Derek Wynn like? Um, I, I, a couple of different things. One, I've always been accident prone. I can think prompt. of, yeah, I think of, you know, little Derek Wynn. I mean, growing up in upstate New York, you want to do something for fun, you'd hop on your bicycle and go find it. You know, and there wasn't like a perimeter. Like, you kind of naturally knew what the perimeter was. And it was mostly, for the most part, like the next two blocks. Mm -hmm. But we'd go out and find things to do. And I remember one time, like, early memory I flew over the handlebars on my bicycle and landed face first in a pile of cinders next to the railroad tracks <laughs> you know but like little Derek man I don't, I don't really know like I spent a lot of time um, at my grandparents house mm -hmm. a lot of time outside driving my grandfather's tractor like little John De well, it wasn't even John Deere it was a uh, Troy built mm. you know like garden tractor kind of thing mm -hmm. um, into trains into blossoming on from there you know planes and stuff like that but were you just a normal kid were you you're a intellectual guy were you reading early were you i mean was it obvious that you were a smart kid when you were uh i don't, early, I don't young? really i don't really think so um i think one of the things that that i've i've kind of been told and then of course have adopted and as like the bible and truth and everything mm -hmm. else which is i was i was sharp but then I kind of also figured out like, okay, how sharp do you have to be to get by kind of thing, <laughs> you know? So 
but I think we all do that. Uh, well, I really identify with that one. Yeah. Um, there have been many people in my life who have you know, said, if you would just apply yourself a little bit more when I was younger, I really look for the easy way out most of the time. Um, so what, what part of upstate New York? Uh, near Binghamton, Oneonta, that area, a small town called Bainbridge, New York. Do you know that there's a town here that is called Oneonta? Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's about 45 minutes from here, an hour. Okay. But it is somehow, it, southern people probably misspelled it from the Indian translation. So Oneonta is a town not far from here. Got it. Um, how many people in the town you grew up in? Uh, about 1,200. That's pretty small. Yeah. Because there's around 80-ish thousand here. Yeah. And Gunnersville is still a pretty small town. Um, if, you, if we go to high school, D-Dub... Now, what kind? What give us paint a picture of what you were like in high school? Um, I was a total loser, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not like a degenerate loser, right? Not like I was into all sorts of different stuff um, that I shouldn't have been. Uh, I was just kind of a dork. I was kind of a nerd. Um, I joke with people all the time and say like, I wish I was this popular in high school, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, Would have been a lot easier. But no, I was just I was an average kid even then. Um, got my first job when I was sixteen. Um, mostly because I wanted to have wheels on yeah. a car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you had a car, small town, you know how it is. You have freedom. You can yep. go do things. Um, so I worked a lot. You know, from starting at the age of sixteen when I could actually work in New York, that's what I did. Yeah, that's a lot of it. Well, we now know that nerds rule the world. Yeah. Anytime someone says their kid's really nerdy, I'm like, fantastic, because guess what? All these thousands of uh, little league parents who are pushing their kids to be you know nba players or baseball players or football players i just wish i've said it a bunch of times because our kids are older now i wish people would put the same emphasis on science and math and reading and entrepreneurship in life as they do in like being ridiculously overbearing in sports as for kids i was i was on a plane not too long ago i was actually flying it was when i was flying back from huntsville hmm. had an open enrollment and I sat next to a nice guy. I always try to make it a point, no matter where I am, like talk to an absolute stranger. You know, mm -hmm. not even like from a work perspective, just find out. He was retired military. And, and we talked about kids. And he talked about his kids. And how his son got him a book and these things. And he said, one of the things he always tried to teach his son from an early age was to be in with the outs. Hmm. And it just stood out to me. It's like, no, it makes a lot of sense. It's like be in with the nerdy kids. Yeah. I want to... I'm, I'm going to take a detour by not going chronological now and press on something. At what point do you think you started making it a practice to talk to a stranger? Uh, probably, probably when I would ride. I, I think I, I started it when I would ride in a cab. Because, okay. because here's the thing, which is people who are cab drivers, now Uber, or Lyft, anything like that, they typically are going to have the best experiences that they can share about the place they're driving you to or from or in. Um, that, I would say that's probably like the biggest place where it started. So whenever I was old enough to start taking a cab or an Uber or Lyft, you know, mm -hmm. was I would say when it started. So probably cabs first. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, so how does it, how do you approach people? I know this is a weird question, but I do think there are people who are like, that sounds fun, but I don't know how to do that. So just sit down beside someone in the airport how's that what's your mo for that um usually usually ask someone like if i'm in an airport i'll ask them like where they're going are they going are you going to to home or from home mm -hmm. you know that's one of the big things um and and try to find a common thread to talk from there and some people don't want to talk sometimes mm -hmm. i don't want to talk but i've i've found a ton of value in just understanding who people are mm-hmm like, where are you from? Where are you going? How often do you do this? What do you like about where you're going? Things like that, because everyone can talk about it. Um, sometimes they don't, but. Mm -hmm. Val makes fun of me. I share this characteristic with you. So even when we were very recently, we we're at a bar somewhere, like a, re like a bar at a restaurant, and we're kind of sitting at a corner table, like we're on one corner and another couple is at the separate corner. And she just knows me so well. She sees me like kind of perk up and She's like, here we go. Like she knew it, I was, uh, I said something to the couple, yep. which led to a long conversation. And um, I've learned over the years, I'm fascinated with people. Really just curious yeah. around 
who they are and what their story is, even so much so that we were talking to our travel planners yesterday. We're trying to do like a big vacation or two a year. We're getting a little older. I just had a whole presentation at the True Owners meeting on being temporarily able to do things that, you, that are meaningful. So I didn't do any travel growing up. So I really want to do a bunch now. And when they were asking us what's important to us about travel, we talked a full 30 minutes and I finally said, you know, what really resonates with me are conversations with people doing a cooking class or talking to people who happen to be English speaking in a restaurant in Italy or Spain or wherever we're going. It really is about the people experience that moves me. I wonder, do you think that is natural in our DNA? Is it learned? Like, were you always a little curious? Um, I, I would say like to a degree. Um, here's, here's one of the big things is I tend to think I've got a good read on people, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, it's people have told me best judge of character before I even talk to someone. Mm -hmm. And I hate saying it because it's like, do I judge a book by its cover kind sure. of thing? But I tend to be a really good judge of character. So I'll find the people who are more approachable to start with, you know, like if you put, if you put, let's just say I'm in an airport and you know. Again, not trying to go anywhere on this. One guy looks like he's out of a GQ magazine cover, mm -hmm. and the other guy looks like he's, you know, in a band or something. I'm gonna go talk to the dude in the band, right? You know, like yeah. that's just me. Like, I, I always try to seek out interesting people with interesting stories, and and part of it is is because they've probably been places and done things that I haven't, mm -hmm. and I want to know what those experiences are. And sometimes you get good life advice. Like you talk about kids with people. Mm -hmm. You get great life advice talking about that kind of stuff. It's interesting. I want to stay here for just a second because I do share a lot of these same characteristics with you, whether it's on purpose or, or we discovered it works, whatever. I've often said that part of what I'm good at is being able to kind of tell what people really want, even at, at work, at personal lives, to be able to read a room a little bit and like read between the lines they said this but they really meant that or did you happen to catch that imperceptible nod the purpose to the left or that side eye look that somebody else gave or the way that they all that um i'm going to talk work for a little bit it's very powerful to be able to do that in a work setting as a producer consultant yeah you just happen to be able to perceive what someone really wants have you found that it is incredibly helpful for you and your job. A hundred percent. I think I think there's there's two sides to that, right? Because part of it's being able to look at someone else and try to reverse engineer what they're looking for, or their objections, what they're looking not for. Mm -hmm. You know, in some cases. But I think the two the second side of that equation really comes back to self awareness. So if you can do it with someone else, can you also do it with yourself? And, and try to pinpoint some of the deficiencies to be hard on yourself, but also at the same time to play to potential strengths. Bro, I'm s you're straight up giving my presentation from the owner's meeting that you weren't even there. You Wasn't didn't get that? to see it. Yeah. I'm sending that to you. You're going to be like, whoa. I want man, to see it. it is, I mean, you're, di you're dialed in to the presentation. We're all over the whole thing, by the way, for people who didn't see that. We just had a true event that I mentioned earlier, which is just the owners and practice leaders of true firms get together once a year um uh, dw has uh, three kids a busy life a, a, a very large book of business and a busy travel schedule you had to say no to something i'll be there next year totally i heard it. everyone has told me it's the best one yet it was but i do want to send you my presentation yeah um all right let me i'm going to jump back we may come back to this because this is an interesting topic around intuition all the listening curiosity but let's talk about how you got here so um tell me about your parents growing up like yep. what what they do how do they parent like just give me a little 411 wait is that even a thing anymore yeah it still is it's 41 i'm pretty sure it's still out there okay <laughs> give me some info on the, yeah. on the parentals. um so parents grew up in the same area right so they had a, a whole life before before me, right? So my grandfather, were, uh, you know, came back from World War II. He built his house, um, you know, with his own two hands kind mm -hmm. of thing. 
met my grandmother. This is on my mother's side. Uh, on the other side of the family, my grandfather uh, retired from Coca-Cola, right? Only out to New York. Only out to New York was home to the largest roundhouse in the world after we blew up the Germans in World War II. Mm-hmm. So if you're into trains and anything like that. Um, so father had a big family. Uh, my mother didn't have a big family, but we kind of ended up living like right there in the middle, right? Between the two. So I had lots of uh, good family experiences as a result of that. Um, my father, again, worked on the railroad. He left the railroad because railroad is tumultuous, right? You get laid off, mm-hmm. um, you go on strike, so on and so forth. And he ended up taking an office job about the time I was in high school. Um, my mother actually uh, worked same job, same place, her entire career. You mm-hmm. know, like right out of high school kind of thing. So, yeah, growing up, I, I think, you know, my parents always worked to do really good by mm-hmm. us. That was like the biggest thing. Um, being in a small town, you don't get exposed to a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, like we talked about this, like you're in a small town. I think that's why one of the big things where kids get to serve these days is in terms of understanding what opportunities are out there. But, you know, they did, they did good, you know, raising me and my brother. And Would you, like a, a bluish color background? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Working class. Yep. And your brother's younger. Uh, he's four years younger. Yeah. Four years younger. Um, and then when you're in high school, when you're kind of a nerdy kid in high yep. school, and you're going to go to college, you went somewhere locally, right? Yep. Where'd you go? Where'd you go to college? Our way, Cortland State. Cortland State. Yep. What's the mascot of Cortland State? That's a red dragon. What? Yeah. That's the first time I've ever heard that mascot. Not yeah. just a dragon, but a red dragon. Red dragon. Now, is it just a red dragon, or is it's there a- some? It's a red dragon. Just a dragon that's red. Yep. I wanted to be in part of that conversation. Yeah. Like, what do you think we're going to be? Like, yeah, yeah. We can't just, uh-oh. Yeah, there it is. So we've got it pulled up. Britt Burns, Google Master back there, is showing us the Cortland Red Dragons. I that's just it. love silly stuff like this. Where it's like someone was like, I mean, just a dragon? But isn't there like a South Carolina university has got like a dragon or something like that? So like you, I, I look at it, and it's like the same thing. So like UA, that's UAB, University of Alabama, yeah. Birmingham, is the Blazers, okay. and there's a green dragon. We'll pull that up. Let's see if this is what is this what you're talking about? No, there was there's a South Carolina school. I don't know which one, but okay, we're gonna have to Google South Carolina College Dragons. Now we're gonna have to really see what this is about. I don't know what South. Do you know we say South Kakalaki around here? Yeah, there you go. Who is that? Well, like you've got the Gamecocks, which is kind of like it. Maybe they're like looking at it and it's like, hey, instead Upstate of being a chicken, dragons. we're going to be a dragon. It's going to look the same, but look at the logo. All I'm saying is the red dragons is unique. Yeah. You've got dragons, you got blazers. Well, you got like 30 SUNY schools red in New York. Dragon. Like, how do you come up with more? I don't know. I just love it. I'm just saying, yeah. I think they could have done a little bit more with the logo. Like, it's just a white sea with a dragon. Yeah. But anyway, we've probably spent way too much time on the red dragons. So Maybe. you get there. Yep. Do you live in a dorm on campus or are you commuting? Yep. First two years on a, in a dorm. Uh, last two years off campus, but right there in town. Uh, any change? And a lot of people maybe try to reinvent themselves or change in college. Was it the same you? Like- uh, no, it's totally different. Okay. Um, I, I, I thank all of my friends for that, mm. right? Because all of my friends were wild. <laughs> um, you know, they, the, you talk about the degenerate side, like we were degenerates in, in college. Right. Um, you know, it was, it was one of those things we had a really, really good time. And it's those types of relationships where we could all get back together. We may not remember everything that happened, but right. I could jump on a plane today <laughs> and be with them for an entire weekend and pick up right where we left yeah. off. Um, but yeah, I, I think I changed a, a bit as a result of that. Um, I've been the same person, but maybe more sociable, maybe yeah. more approachable, I don't know. But that's a cool thing about college. It's what it's supposed to do a little bit. Yeah. Right? I the good thing is none of my degenerate friends will listen to this because it's kind of a worky podcast. But I went to several schools, but Jacksonville State University, also the Gamecocks, here in Alabama, is a very degenerate school. Like just party like crazy. And some of those a couple of those guys are, are really good friends even today. My my college roommate, uh Richie Rice, shout out to Richie. He'll never listen to it, but it would be cool if he did, because he would like he would beam with pride that I said his name. Yeah, uh, he's actually you know when I was talking to you earlier about my fishing buddy, Richie is the same friend that takes me fishing all the time. There you go. Um, there so, you go. college. Um, it's time to get out of college. 
what was that like, the transition? Because a lot of my son's friends now, and soon to be Carson and Tess, our children, are going to be leaving school, entering the real world. What was that like for you? Were you interviewing? Like, Just kind of take me back to that senior year preparing for real world. Yeah, so, um, well, I, I ended up spending an extra semester there. So I was a super senior. Um, and it was going back to, like, the poor advising from, like, guidance counselors even right. in college because I had to stay an extra year to do my student teaching program. Um, it was interesting because I ended up going to a job fair at Penn State. You know, like, being a teacher and trying to get a job in December is hard. But I went to a job fair at Penn State, and I saw that Anne Arundel County Public Schools was hiring. Mm-hmm. You know, they had a booth there. And I was like, are you looking for social studies teachers? And he says, as a matter of fact, let's go talk. <laughs> um, next thing you know, I was down there for an interview and moving everything down two weeks after that. So I, I need to jump back. I skipped on you deciding to be a teacher. Yeah. When did that enter your head? And when did it become cemented that, yeah, yeah I think I'm going to be a teacher? Uh, I think it was probably somewhere around my junior year of high school. Oh, and that early. Yeah, it wasn't really like for any good reason. Other than, again, lack of exposure to what's possible, what else is out there. Um, I, I determined along the way that I, I enjoyed history. It was one of the classes that I continued to like do well in. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to go teach history. And then I was, okay, well, what school do I go to? And I found Cortland had a dual major program. So it was education as one major and then history as another. Um, and that's where I just settled on it. You know, it was an hour away from home. Mm-hmm. And that was just far enough. So you get your first job in Pennsylvania. It was at Penn State, but in Maryland. That oh, was Maryland. an interesting part. I'd never been to Maryland in my entire life. Okay. Until I was driving down there for an interview and you know, gotcha. got the job. And your first job is teaching social studies? Yep. I taught, um, you know, Drew Short Straws, being like a mid-year teacher coming in early and everything else. I taught ninth through 12th grade. So my ninth grade was government, 10th grade world history, which I hated. It was my worst subject ever, and it was mostly because I could never get all of the names straight. <laughs> right. Um, and then uh, junior uh, U.S. history, and then I taught 12th grade, 10th grade world history. So it was all the kids that couldn't get through it the first okay. two times they tried. So what was that? Well, I'm going to do this in a weird way, but how long did you teach? Uh, two and a half years. Okay. I want to jump back again because I skipped over something. Is in that in your senior year of college... You worked at a facility for troubled kids. Is that my yep. saying that right? Yep. Like a juvenile detention home, or what was it? It was a home. Okay. Yep. And I don't know. I think that's just an interesting experience. Talked about that experience. Um, yeah, it was. It was. It was enriching. Right. It wasn't a lot of fun doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, because you you get to see kind of like a, a dark part of the world. You know, you get to hear stories about kids who were talking about this. I mean, the kids who would smoke crack with their mom, Mm -hmm. you know, 15 years old, 16 years old, whatever. Um, One kid who was who was 12 years old and he was a drug mule Mm -hmm. for his father. Um, You know, and you had other kids who, you know, were in separate units, but they were in the sex offender units because they had it of course perpetrated upon them right. and one of the big things we know about sex offenders a lot of times is that they end mm-hmm. up returning the favor yeah um so it was it was really not a lot of fun but you learn a lot right you learn a lot about how to deal with difficult people you know in that process but you were 21 22 years old 21 years old yep yeah that's so early one of the things that's been a consistent theme on super troopers is how many people of a younger, uh, older generation, Brit, you know, Brit ran off to Texas at 19 and was working seven days a week. Uh, and there's been several other people who are like, like you at 21, are in a youth detention home trying to provide good guidance for kids when you're kind of still a kid. Yeah. Did that have any impact uh, on your desire to like, like, okay, I've, I really am onto something I think I like in teaching, or did it plant a seed of like, oh, this is kind of bad? Did it have any I, impact on your decision making? Uh, the only thing I think it did is, is I decided I never want to go back and do it again. Mm-hmm. That was the biggest thing. But I said, hey, this is going to look great on a resume. Mm-hmm. You know, because everything was like, okay, I'm going to go be a teacher. And, you know, mind you at this point, so like one of the big things through college and one of the, the big benefits as it came to be with my parents working where they did was is that we would go in there as summer help. 
and we would make $2 less than whatever the union wage on the, was on the floor and to run CNC machines all summer long, right? So me and a couple of friends were like really industrious and we figured it out, okay, second shift is the money shift because second shift you can work on a Friday, I could work from, um, you know, let's say like 3.30 in the afternoon to midnight and then do another four hours into Saturday. Mm -hmm. Go home, sleep for eight hours, go back in. I could then work eight hours on Saturday a time and a half and then four hours a double time on Sunday <laughs> and then do it all over again, right? So like we figured out how to get 16 hours of double time on Sundays. <laughs> and all that's to say like everything has always been, you know, about work and I think hard work. Um, you know, we'd work 84 hours a week in the summertime, you know, which is supposed to be like the best summer, you know, summertime is supposed to be the best time in the world. Right. When you're 19, 20, 21 years old. And it was because we would work hard and we'd go back to school and we had money to pay for everything. Mm -hmm. But it was really back at school too, where, you know, doing things like that, I'd look at like, hey, this is great for a resume when I go to get a teaching job. Right. You know, not really, really realizing anything beyond that. I'm going to jump back again because things just keep coming to me that I kind of missed in the uh, early years. We were talking last night around where you said your father worked for the railroad and he stopped and got an office job. But part of that was because of something you did. And can you just talk about like your father coming home and finding you like in the front yard? Yeah, it was, you know, and, and the memory's kind of blurry around it. But I remember being at a certain point and you know i, I want to say that he was there were also some jobs in between so he was laid off from the railroad ended up taking a buyout program um he drove short body truck for a while so he was a truck driver and, and there was something that happened along that way between that and when he got an office job where i had basically like decided hey it's time to sell some stuff some of these things is like uh, i don't know what i was 10 12 14 years mm -hmm. old we need to start selling some of these things because you know there's not a paycheck coming in the house right now right um accuracy on that not totally spot on but yeah i remember that yeah but i think it's just interesting when i'm thinking around just what makes people people what makes you you your life experiences your perspective it's all shaped by our past experiences and walking through these things can be enlightening around um, well, you just talked about self-awareness yep. uh, earlier, um, which I think we're going to get back there. Um, I'm going to get back on schedule with the timeline here. So now you're teaching. Now, you only did it for two and a half years. So what about that experience was like, okay, I'm probably not going to do this the rest of my life. Uh, it was a few things. I think, you know, the, the politics of teaching, right? So schools, I quickly found, just taught to a test. Yeah, that's, that's really like the American education system today mm -hmm. is you're largely teaching to a test, especially teaching AP US history. Schools were evaluated based on how many kids sat for the test, not how many kids passed it. So we're setting a lot of kids up for failure in that process. Um, I was a first, second year teacher serving on faculty council, taking on a bunch of added responsibilities. And at the same time, you know, I, I actually found my pay stub not too long ago, hmm. like my first pay stub. And in my first year teaching, I want to say I, I, I grossed thirty four thousand dollars. Right. Living in Annapolis, Maryland, which is you know high cost of living and everything else. So I said, okay, no life goals were ever going to be realized by doing this. I was um, working nights, weekends in the summertime at a yacht club, hmm. right? You know, because it's like why not? Right. Um, kind of going back to that, just hard work kind of uh, aspect. Um, so, anyways, long story short, I ended up getting to the point where I ended up falling into the world of wholesale sale insurance. You know, it was through a, a gal I was dating at the time, her roommate from college came to town. He was at Unum, hmm. Dave McDermott, shout out Davey. Um, and he's like, hey, I want you to talk to this guy. I want you to talk to this guy because I think you, you could do a, what I do. Who, who did you talk to? I know, I know so many people at Unum, I'm just curious if the person. Yeah, Kurt Wittelsberger uh, was the guy who got me in. Um, you know, and the manager at the time was Dan Sisk. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up going through the whole process. And you know. I, I know so many people in our world who started their career at Unum and went through sort of an acclaimed training program. I mean, I'm thinking of, um, well, like Matt Capagrossi, which runs the Atlanta market. He may do more than that. I don't know, Cap, sorry about that, what your job is, but I've known him forever. Um, and he's one of the best human beings uh, I've ever known. 
and then Shay Treadway, who's I dare say going to be the CEO of Principal one day. I mean, is is running their insurance enterprise division. That's not the right title either. It's all of employee benefits and the retirement plan. One of the smartest people I know in Shay Treadway. I could just go on and on about all the people that I know that started at Unum. What was that training program like? Did you also find it really good? Is it as good as they say, or how, maybe then was different than now? I don't know. No, it was it was good. So like. This was, um, so it was funny, the timing of everything. I decided to leave a, you know, public sector job in, what would it have been? It was like 2008, hmm. 2007, going into 2008. Um, and, and that was a major change um, to go into the private sector. You know, going into 2008 and global financial crisis, my parents were so upset because I would never use my degree again. Oh, yeah. Um, but but what was interesting about it was the training program was good. I did a good job in terms of like understanding a lot of the content, but I was also like a non-traditional hire for Yenum. So I came in, I was 24 going on 25 at the time, somewhere mm-hmm. around there. Um, most everyone else was right out of college. Yeah. And there were actually only a couple of people that, that you know, were non, more of their non-traditional hires. So, Suffice it to say, like the training program is really good because they make sure that you get all of the content and you can exhibit what they ask you to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to trade school. Um, you know, you go up to training school. You go up to Portland. Spend two weeks up there, and you spend a week in Chattanooga, mm-hmm. a week or two weeks. Um, but it was really, really good. You know, a lot of people that were you in. Were you a quote unquote group rep out of the gate? Yeah. Right out of the gate. So I was actually one of the core reps. So we were selling both group and VB. Yeah. That was what they decided to do at the time. Yeah. They've gone back and forth on that a couple of times. Yeah. Um, and what year was this and what was your first market? Uh, so this was, this would have been like 2008, yeah. give or take. And my market was all the way from really like Northern Virginia down to Roanoke, Norton, all the way down the 81 corridor. And did you move for this job? You stayed um, in Maryland. So I stayed in Maryland because at the time, I was living in Baltimore, which is a great city. Um, living in Baltimore, the office was in Columbia, Maryland, and I was driving down every other week. Hmm. When, how long were you at Unum? Uh, t- another two and a half years. Okay, yep. all right. And then what, I like it when I get into things I don't know yeah. about the story. So what led you to leave and where'd you go? So... I had, I had been living out of the car kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and a couple of guys called me. I was actually in Columbia, South Carolina that day, somewhere around there. And we used to always do these games. Like, you know, we had this one game called The Wizard. Right? The Wizard. And it was like, yeah, yeah, I'll teach you the game later. Okay. Another story for another day. <laughs> so I'm like, what are these guys doing? Like, I'm on meetings, you know, and both of them are trying to call me. And I thought it was just one of the pranks. I'm like, I'll let you go a voicemail and deal with it later. And um, they were both like, no, no, we met with these guys at BBG. There's a guy who wants to like bring in a new producer to mm. take on a small group, and we think you'd be awesome to do it. You know, so like they look good for a broker they call on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm happy because I'm not traveling anymore, and it's right. another career opportunity and everything else. Okay, so that I, I, for some reason I thought there was a stop in between you know, and BBG. No, no, straight there. Um, I'm gonna change this topic a little bit how long had you been at bbg when you met till you met your wife oh man um that would have been she's gonna kill me so probably about a a year after i started year and a half after i started that's great so i can jump here and i don't have to go back too far yeah i ask this question a lot the first moment you locked eyes what's your wife's name melissa melissa the first did she go by Mel or anything like that? Is she just Melissa? Yeah, you can call it whatever you want. I don't know. Mel, she likes Mel. I can just okay. call her Melissa. So the first moment you locked eyes. Yeah. Like really, like not just you saw her, but the first moment there was a, oh, hey. Yeah. Um, it probably was like the first time I saw her. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was funny because you could tell she had just gotten back from working out. She had like not totally started there yet. Right. Uh, but she's got workout clothes on. She's a sweaty mess, but she had a big smile. Mm-hmm. And she was like, hi, Melissa, you know, and she was being introduced by her 
departing office manager. But yeah, that was like, you know, the first time I looked out and I was like, Hey, you know, nice to have a change of scenery around the office kind of <laughs> right. thing. Uh, and then, um, you know, fast forward after that, um, I don't know what it was. Like I, I just finally like worked up the courage one time, like, you know, a year after and I was like, Hey, do you want to go get drinks, go get dinner, something like that, you know? And it was do you like remember a, the first date? Um, the first, the first real date I want to say, and she's going to kill me. My memory isn't as good as it used to be. Like I got a lot of work stuff clogging it up. Um, yeah, we had, uh, our, our first, so it was funny because we've talked about this recently. We, we dated initially and then we're like, okay, it's too weird because of work, you know, don't want to do it and everything else. Um, and fast forward and like we had stayed friends. It was totally amicable and we ended up getting back to the point of dating again. It was February 17th. Um, not sure on the year, but it was <laughs> 10 years ago this year. Right. Uh, we went and saw a movie together and mm. she still has the movie ticket stuff. Do you remember the movie? Uh, yeah. So we've, we've gone back and forth on this. I'm convinced it was side effects. Jake Gyllenhaal, he was like running drugs, okay. like pharmaceutical drugs yeah. to help old folks. And he was a drug rep and whatever else. But And she says it's different? She can't remember. Oh, okay. But it's not on the ticket stub either. It, We've oh. got a date and time, but yeah. Surely the world of the interweb can figure we that out. We could figure it out. We could figure it out. Um, okay, I'll come back to this. All right. Um, then we'll jump back into work. So you take over the small group, Bach. Yep. What's what are those first two years like? Like being on the broker side, what was the what was the environment like? Um, it was it was challenging because I knew everything in the world there was to know about life and disability coverage, but that's you know that much of what we do on a daily basis mm -hmm. um, on the broker side. So it was a lot of learning, um, accelerated and fast tracked by the fact that you know, there was some turnover happening at the same time. So I kind of like stepped in to do some other stuff as well, you know, helping to renew those mm -hmm. groups. And, and not only that, but the, you know, learning the business at the same time. A um, couple of good mentors along the way, some added hard work, um, you know, it all worked out. But the first couple of years were tough because you're kind of feeling your way through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you're trying to learn the business, learn how to consult, learn how to find new clients, right? Um, so I ended up going back to kind of like, okay, well, all of these clients, they're upsell opportunities because most of them didn't have life disability coverage, things right. like that. I ended up trying to leverage what I knew. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I, I still am today, but I would say like, when it comes to prospecting, I'm not the best prospector there is, mm -hmm. just not. Um, being able to relate to someone, understand them and kind of work through that process, that's great if you can get me in front of someone. Um, but what's interesting about it is those first two years, yeah, there was like, there were some tough moments, but I don't think I ever got to the point of saying like, I can't do this. Yeah. It was just, it was what it was. Just wanted to make it happen. Well, you say you're not a good prospector, and I know what you're saying. Most people, when they reach a certain point in their career, there's not a lot of time to do it, and not much appetite either, really, because th th there are, quote unquote, more important things to do, right? You're trying to understand healthcare and the complexity of that so you can deliver good solutions to your clients, but yet you've grown a very large book of business, again, in the top 1% of consultants out there. So how are you finding clients? Is it referral based? Is it, I'll just, how are you finding clients? Yeah, it's a few different things. So like some of it's actually like hard work that's paid off. Mm -hmm. um, clients going on to a new business, for example, right? Mm -hmm. So. HR turnover is a blessing and a curse, but it tends to work out. Um, the other big part of it too, really comes back to me putting myself out there. So building connections, whether it's through centers of influence, like mm. referral partners, that's like the biggest area for, you know, really my wins, I would say, is, is centers of influence that I've cultivated over the years. Um, trying to really put myself front and center when it comes to events, you know, discussions, whatever it may be. Um, outside of that though, I mean like really leveraging technology for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. We do a lot in terms of trying to generate inbound leads, um, whether it's through blogs and content and just whatever it may be. But, you know, relationships are, are number one in terms of that list. It's, um, how have you, well, let me, I think I need to ask this question first. Do you remember our first webinar or Zoom call? It would have been during COVID. It was, oh yeah, it was during COVID. I sure. want to say it was um, like a virtually virtual. Might have been the first one. Yeah, we. I mean, we had a 
I'm trying to think around how your name got to me. Oh, I know what it was. Um, uh, Scott Patterson, Scotty P on our team, I think knew Jess, yep. who, who used to be on your team yep. because she used to be with principal yep. and had a conversation with her and then she set up a call with you. Yeah, um, Brandon was on there. And, so Brandon was on there and then we kind of got the conversation going of like, okay, what is this? Yeah. You know, and it's funny because I had like seen this Southern guy, you know, <laughs> bald head on LinkedIn. It was like, what is, what is he out there doing? And then, you know, it all ended up coming to fruition. I remember being on the call. I, what, maybe the second call was a larger team call because I'm the list was on there. Yep. Michelle was on there. And I mean, I can, it was here. I think I was in this studio. This used to be our office office over there on the table. I'm pointing to my right where Brit is. And I get to the point where I ask at the end what everybody's first concert was. And Liz said, new edition. And I, and I got kind of giddy around it. Uh, and I kind of remember everybody's faces. There was just kind of a smiling, like a cultural moment, I think, where it was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Do you remember uh, having the conversation of, yes, we should, let's try it out? Um, I think it was one of those things where, where we kind of looked at it like it was a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. But I think what excited us the most was, wait, we can talk to other brokers who aren't in our market and we won't compete with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe we could do a, better maybe we could do more whatever that might have been yeah you know so that was that was the big push on that side all right i'm going to come back to that that just kind of hit me now you're two and a half years in at bbg you met melissa yeah now you're dating dating yeah um what was the time frame you're, you're super humble and you deflect praise but i'm going to push you to answer this so you might as well answer the first time um when did it click? You know, when did it kind of black work wise? Yeah. Um, I, I think a big part of it probably would have been around 2016, um, 2015, 2016. And it was really kind of a couple of key things that drove that, which is new relationships that had, you know, great introductions, great referrals, um, learning new things, you know, in the world of self-funding, you know, different mm -hmm. types of programs that are out there. Um, so that constant growth evolution and, and really kind of putting them all into practice. Uh, I think that's like really where it started to really click. So maybe about the five year mark. And we talk about it like teaching, you know, you teach for like anywhere more than three years and you're a lifer kind of the same thing yeah. with the world of employee mm -hmm. benefits which is if you can make it five years <laughs> yeah. you're a lifer too um just because all of that hard work all of that groundwork that gets laid up front it takes a lot for that to fall through yeah the back end sometimes it's um when i look at the team that you guys have right now and i think what's interesting if first of all i don't think we see ourselves as the way the world sees us right nor do we see your, your, your team. Like our families are a good example. Like my kids see me way differently than anybody else, right? Um, when I look at your team and I see Brandon and Liz and Michelle and Sarah, and this is where I should not name people because I forget people, yep. but other people who have come to true events, Jamie, I apologize to everybody I'm not naming right now. You got most of them. But um they're so engaged i think the word that i that's the word that i would use is that they're smart and they seem loyal and they seem really dialed in to want to be better and do good things what if you agree with me which we're gonna have to cut if you don't because this is going to be bad if you say yeah. you don't what's gone into making up the team that i see and perceive as being so strong um What's, what's funny about it is, if you go back, one of the, the core principles that like I think, you look at everyone who got hired on that list, me, Brandon, Michelle, Liz, all of us been there more than, more than 10 years, 12 years, hmm. some 14, 16 years. So like we kind of went through all of these different evolutions, right? So you've got early BBG, 
you've got you know the the you know Derek and Brandon BBG when we kind of came into the mix, uh, both about the same time as year mm-hmm. apart, and then you've got really kind of like a post COVID BBG, you know, in terms of a bunch of different stuff that happened there. And, um, I think one of the core tenants that our owners had at the time was always hire people that are better than you are, mm-hmm. right? I also think a big part of that comes down to this natural curiosity that I think everyone on the team has of, well, what if this does work? Mm-hmm. What if this is a better way of doing things? Well, we have to try it and find out. You know, and I think I've, I've always kind of said this, which is, which is someone who kind of goes into the expert category is just someone who stopped learning. Right. You know, and it's not really the case, but I don't think any of us would, would look at ourselves and say, we've got it all figured out. Yeah. So it's that constant push and challenge and growth really, you know, is, is a big part of that too. When you're growing, you have to find a way to figure it out. <laughs> right. Right. Um, there's not any one or two things I don't think that really goes into it other than making sure that you continue to remain curious, Mm -hmm. make sure that you are continuing to have the best hiring practices and not make sure that you're hiring someone just to hire them. Um, And at the same time, just just understanding that you've got to have a seat when the music stops and it's continuing to grow. Um, What year was your oldest born? Uh, So we have twins that were born in 2018. Right. Yep. Okay. That's right. So, and then a three, three and a half year old as well. Yep. Okay. Yep. COVID baby. So you, it's hard to believe it's been that long ago. Yeah. Bro, that's crazy to say that. The COVID was three years ago. Man, Almost that is four. That, that may be a whole other show where we sit around and talk about that year. Where like, we just where are they now? Yeah. Holy yeah. cow. So 2015, 16, you kind of, it clicks with you. Yep. And then you, not soon after that, you have a family. Yep. And you've had a growing family now since then, right? Yep. Busy household, twins and a three and a half year old. How are you navigating a very large book of business, a leadership role in the company and a family? Uh, it's not always easy. Um, so, so one of the things I always tell people is like, I'm very fortunate that I met my wife at work. You know, I don't cast far from the dock. Um, because she also understands what that means Mm -hmm. in terms of like the day to day and like, you know, just what all goes into it and the demands of the job. Um, The second part of it, I think comes back to, it's not always easy in the sense of there's, there's often missed opportunities, work things, personal things, kid things, whatever it may be. Um, And really trying to get work harder toward finding better balance in that. Mm -hmm. Like I've had good balance, um, you know, it's like, what am I going to miss if I'm not home at a certain time, like other than like food all over the floor, because <laughs> you know, the kids are throwing it. Um, but now it's at a point where I think it is going to be harder because yeah. you've got sports and you've got school events and stuff like that, that I just want to be part of. But at the same time, kind of like that, that work aspect. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, job is always important. Right, because that's what enables all of these other yeah. things. We teach that in disability. <laughs> your paycheck is your most important yeah. asset, right? But but there certainly needs to be a balance. You know, I'm still trying to figure that out. It's interesting. You're getting to that age. Um, I can remember. I said this recently, and someone was like, "Oh, cry me a river." I was. I, I said these words because I was when my, when Carson started playing soccer. Uh, we were in Birmingham, this a suburb of Birmingham, and not a suburb with a great soccer program. So the dads or moms, you had to teach. I mean, you had to coach. Well, you didn't have to. They just were like, if you do not, some, we're, you know, we can't have a, a rec league team. And so from the time Carson was five or six until about 10, 11, he played fall and spring soccer. And I coached all those years. So I might be coached 10 seasons of soccer. Yeah. Not knowing much about football either, by the way. Um, I Googled and watched a lot of YouTube. But I would cancel everything you know, the quote I was is that like I turned down two trips to the Masters. My first two in- invites, I, I didn't go because he had soccer games or practices. Like that's some Herculean thing that I had to, you know. But it's true. Like you, you're getting into an age where it's going to be harder for you to miss stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the biggest thing is, you know, I don't want to miss things where they know I missed it. You know, it was it was funny. Like I'll tell you the story. So I, the kids didn't know I'd be there. 
it was actually so funny story. So like we had, we had this trip booked in December and it was um, the same day as the Christmas pageant. Right. And it was one of those things I was just going to live stream it from the truck because it's like, they won't know that I'm missing, right. but it was really funny because, you know, I ended up staying and, um, uh, my oldest daughter sees me in the crowd. She's like scanning back and forth. I see her lock in and then blows me a kiss, mm. you know? And I was like, and I caught it on camera. Um, and she's up there singing and having a good time. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's kind of where, again, it's like things click, yep. like work, things click, family, things click. Um, figuring out what makes it click, you know, based on that moment in time is important. It's a, such a good memory. That's such a, I mean, that is really, that is sort of the meaning of what we're doing. By the way, I just realized, I just talked about the Masters. I'm wearing a Masters shirt. There you go. I have fought my entire career against the white mill stereotype insurance guy. And if someone was watching this for the first time, I would be lumped right in that category. Yep. Apologies, everybody. Um, so, we're getting, you're solidly um, kind of at the top of your game as a consultant. Now you've got lofty goals. Mm-hmm. You have a goal to almost double your book of business in how many years? Uh, almost double in, in, let's just say, like the next two to three years. Yeah. Okay, that's aggressive. Um, what are the biggest challenges? Um, two questions. What are the biggest challenges to get to that goal? Yeah. And secondarily, what are sort of the biggest challenges just on a day-to-day basis on working with clients? A um, couple of different things, which is, you know, turnover, right? So like dealing with new people. Um, it is almost like a rite of passage that someone new comes into your existing client, could have been a 10-year client, mm-hmm. yet you have to prove like your actual worth and existence, like, right. you know, that you're, you're, you're worthy of their business still. Um, which I think like the, the industry has done a really bad job of perpetrating that or perpetuating that. There we go, yeah. that's a better word, perpetuating that through RFPs and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can come back to that. There's, there's more I got on that one, but that's the first issue. The second issue is there's gonna be things you can't control. You know, it's, it's the bottom of your book falling out and that's clients being acquired. Yep. That's, um, you know, personality conflicts. There are sometimes where you get caught in the crossfire of it's the insurance company's fault, but you're the broker and that's where it goes, mm-hmm. right? So I think that's always gonna be the biggest issue, which is attrition within the book. Um, the second biggest issue comes down to really deciding where you allocate your time, okay? Um, We've seen other people in the business, in the sector, who allocate all of their time towards sales activities. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like, you know, yeah. building snowman while it's, you know, 45 degrees out, right? It's just not going to stick. It's going to melt. It's all going to end up falling apart anyways. All you're doing at that point is replacing the top of your book mm-hmm. to replace the bottom of your book. Um, another big challenge really comes down to like, just like bandwidth. Right, and that's where where the person has to step back and say, okay, what am I delegating? You know, it's almost like the stop doing list. Mm -hmm. Um, Craig Lack talks about that a lot, you know, addition by subtraction. I'm gonna subtract these things from my list so I can add these things on. Um, It gets really hard though. Like if you're not effective in terms of managing your time, especially when you have very little of it, Mm -hmm. the question is where do you even replace that loss that you can't control? Right, and at that point, you're you're going from treading water to sinking. Mm-hmm. So it gets harder. Um, I'll say that it was interesting. You go, you go back to talking about COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, man, when when did life get like a lot more complicated? When did it get so much harder? And it was about four years ago when COVID started. And part of the reason why is because we had so many clients. Most of our primary buyer for benefits are HR people. They're the primary point Mm -hmm. of interaction, right? In any scenario, a lot of them are women. And it's kind of the American way, which is during COVID, women were the ones who were at home taking care of kids Mm -hmm. and also at the same time doing their job. So I was working two shifts and then it kind of turned into a bunch of other stuff, but managing that book and managing the, the, the clients at the same time is, is gotten incrementally more difficult but having a good team that can also step in and start to own relationships and be able to start to to mm-hmm. carry that torch forward has really helped a lot too. Um, 
and I've taken on the approach of, of almost like agency within an agency. Yeah. You know, how can we be like the team at the same time, a part of a bigger team, but like we kind of do things our way to be able to, to make it happen on a more positive kind of question. What are you doing? What have you done that has led to your success in building a big book? So whether it be a certain talk track to clients, uh, whether it's some sort of sales tips, like if there's a, a fairly successful producer consultant listening, yeah. they've got a $500,000, dollars book. They're doing okay. They're, well, actually, that would be great for most people, but they're like, hey, I want to take it to the next level. Like, what, what's working for you? Yeah. Um, so you go back to things clicking, right? Um, it, was, it was really interesting because we saw for a long time that producers are being really successful in the market by really parading around the concept of self-funding. And it's like, well, this isn't anything new. It's been around for like 40 years. Mm -hmm. Like, sorry, you just figured it out. Mm -hmm. um, but we saw a lot of that happening. And what's really interesting about it is, is slowly and surely, like we were an early adopter, but we saw every producer trying to sell on that same topic and same thread. And I started pulling on the threads and saying, okay, like let's, let's reverse engineer the problem, mm -hmm. right? Like let's actually wheel it all back and say, where, where, where did this even come into play? And it's all around cost. And it was all around like something new and different. And what we found at the same time was we had to kind of change our messaging because we were concerned of sounding like everybody else again. Yeah. You know, it's like the whole, like what's old is new again kind of thing. Yeah, we, I can save you 30% on your healthcare tomorrow. Would you spend 20 minutes with me? Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that is the opening line from a lot of producers. Yep. And, and what's interesting too, is we also got to the point of realizing we as producers, we as advisors, again, perpetuated a bunch of problems. Mm -hmm. Um, one of those was not actually articulating what it all looks like, what it all means, how one thing sounds like another thing, but it's not actually that thing. We got to the point of really reverse engineering that problem and saying, look, we're just gonna meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. you wanna do this cool thing? We can do the cool thing. You don't wanna do the cool thing? You wanna do this other thing instead? We can do that too. And really differentiating from, from really the rest of our peers. Um, a lot of like my management philosophy for years now has been to take excuses off the table, right? So mm -hmm. if I've got a team member and they're struggling with something, I'm going to say, well, what's that one thing you're struggling with? And what would, it, what would it take to be able to change that? And I get them to name the one or two or three things. And I do what I can to then take all of those excuses off the table and say, look, all of these are gone now. Let's refocus and try again. I'll do the same thing with, with the way we approach sales which is I want to take all the excuses off the table up front. Mm -hmm. No, I can't do business with you because of relationship or because of whatever it is and try to get them to understand value. Um, again, if you're not really good at prospecting, if you yeah. don't get a ton of at bats, you've got to make the most of those opportunities. I totally get that. I think there's a lot of similarities in our styles. I've, I've mentioned before, but gosh, it's been a long time since I was client facing or a producer, but in Alabama, we started the self-funding thing out of necessity because we didn't have any carrier that would pay us commissions. Yep. So I'm going to come up with a year that I had this meeting. This year probably would have been 2000. So I started true 2016, but started working towards it mid 2015. So probably 2011 or 12. I had a conversation with a client and they looked at me and they said, you are taking arrows right now, aren't you? It was a CFO. I was like, what are you talking about? Like all the stuff you're talking about is so complex and so complicated. I get it, but I'm not going to implement it. We're nowhere near ready. Yep. And so you're kind of wasting all your energy on some of these complex ideas. And I kind of had the same aha moment. I was like, oh, okay. You know, I thought I sounded smart by talking about captives and pharmacy carve out and all these sort of idealistic things. But you're right. Some people now are like, acting like it was just invented now. Yeah. Um, when I realized I had to get to know them, I don't think I was smart enough to know. I love, I want to spend some time on that quote you used, which is getting rid of excuses or obstacles or like a tactical way to do that 
with a prospect or even a client. So many people like you talked about are reselling clients now. Yep. Um, that's super interesting, getting rid of excuses. Here's, here's the big thing, which is, you know, we, we talk about this like being a good read on people. Um, I don't like to do a ton of research on a prospect before I walk in mm -hmm. because it confuses me. And it's <laughs> like, I might say something like, oh, I see you're with this ABC company, right? I'm, you're mm -hmm. with the ABC company as your broker. No, we left them a year ago and then it's their 5,500 sold and whatever else. Um, I'd rather kind of go like figure out who they are as a person and address it from that angle. But even sending the note before the meeting and saying, hey, to make the most of your time, what are the top two or three things you want us to focus on? Mm -hmm. Maybe reiterating that question, especially if you forgot, yeah. you know, when you walk in and say like, what's the one thing you'd be disappointed if we didn't talk about it today? And where that's kind of evolved to, and like the latest thing is, okay, I know what your concerns are. Let me just tell you the, the top three to four reasons why people choose to do business with us. And then asking them like, do any of these sound familiar? And that's a new thing we've started doing. Right. And that gives you your sales prospect, sales process from like the actual prospecting moment through the sale um, to be able to refocus that. I'm curious around that. Um, in your talking back and forth with people, have you ever talked about the top four, three or four people would not do business with us? Um, I'm not saying that's a good idea. Yeah, it's just a curious. Haven't gotten to that point, right? In terms of like why why you wouldn't do it, right? But you could take that same three or four, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. point list and totally flip it around. Yeah, because again, it's all about reverse engineering the problem, right? It probably sounds arrogant to do it that way. Now that I think of it, I th but I, I do think it'd be a unique exercise for a salesperson or team to go through both yeah. and see if there are any nuances in there. Um, I, th I, I think it's it's always been harder to be a consultant. And it's why the lead time of selling, quote unquote, consulting like you do, is harder than being an evangelical self-insured person. Because it's kind of like selling a product. You know, I have got a hammer and I am hammering the, you know what, out of anything in front of me with this solution. Yep. Uh, now, oftentimes one could argue that that's better than them doing nothing. It's just easier to sell than it is to consult. Yep. Um, it's always been that way. Yeah, it's almost like one of those things. Like, what do you what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. I'm 40 years old. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow <laughs> right. up. Right. Um, but I know one thing, and that's I like to have options and career paths, and mm -hmm. maybe clients like to have options too. Yeah. Right. So like, <laughs> we do the same thing with our clients, which is we give them opportunities. We create awareness. We create the education. We're going to give them every ounce of what we have to show them the good, bad, and the indifferent of everything. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to choose a path, let them choose the path. But we're going we're gonna to make sure they know about the other path too. Well, there's not many, there's not many people in America who do it better than you. Well, like it's a really cool, like anytime at True, I get an opportunity to get you to get on stage or talk or teach uh, or coach. You know, probably a little bit, maybe your teaching background is creeping in there. Um, What's next for you in terms of travel, industry events, outside stuff? Like what's what's on your calendar the next couple of months? Yeah, so stoked because we've got, of course, like this is in February now, but we've got Healthcare and Harmony coming up. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's going to be exciting. Thing. Got Patriot Days. Really mm -hmm. excited about that. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm most excited about TLA, oh. right? Because there's some people on that list that, you know, I've known Dr. Eric Bricker since... <laughs> I remember the day that he called me selling uh, Compass. Compass, yeah. Like he called me like peddling it, you know, himself, yeah. you know. Um, I'm like, who is this crazy doctor I'm talking to? Um, such a cool dude, though. Yeah. Such so, a cool dude. TLA is True Learning Academy. Yeah. It's sort of our signature event for of the year, an in-person event for producers, consultants, account managers, leaders, operations directors, marketing directors, and like really most people in an agency have a place at TLA, but we have really intentional content for leadership, operations, sales and account management. Um, it's a really cool lineup. You're right. So Anthony Iannarino, who yep. wrote um, Eat Your Lunch, Eat Their Lunch, Eat Their Lunch, Eat yeah. Their Lunch, is doing a workshop. Plus, he wrote a new book called Negativity Fast, which is sort of about his experience with all the negative crap we get dumped on us every day from social to TV, news and media. And then 
We have Dave and Marston Klein, who own a company called the Management Accelerator Program, which are going to do two workshops on being better leaders and managers. And then we have Jen Walsh from Genuine Shift, who's like the guru, the sensei of account management. She's going to do two workshops. Uh, then we've got all sorts of other speakers. So I am excited about that event too. I'm stoked. It is, you guys always do a fantastic job with every event, but there's there's no one out there in terms of the benefit space that has the kind of impact with TLA. I mean, mm-hmm. I was at the one in, when, where, was it, where was it, Fort Worth? And I was like, yeah, this is, this is something I need to come back to. It's interesting how things have evolved. And I mean, it obviously makes me super proud to hear that we're having that impact. So much of this has been um, really attracting quality people, and those people have just helped us get better and better. So when we add a BBG, are we at a Caravis out of St. Louis, like J.J. Flock and his team? Are we at someone like a Chris Hamilton and, and Hotchkiss? And I could go on and on about, you know, these, plenty of these folks are doing very innovative things like you in, in healthcare, but they're also doing incredible work in uh, culture within their agencies, um, leadership within their agencies, um, almost like a more organic approach to an agent to agency per, to personal and professional development, which are the kind of the pistons would makes the whole organization prosper. Yeah. But it's really it's really the people we keep attracting. Um, that's the magic. Um, healthcare and harmony. You mentioned is going to be fun because that's just a one day event on healthcare stuff. And then we have a fun concert at the end. Yep. Um, how's the, what's uh, any milestone events coming up with the family? Do you have any birthdays, anniversaries, dance recitals, um, anything cool coming up? Nothing crazy. We'll go, we moved our beach trip, so we'll be at the beach in, in May. Um, and hopefully, you know, be able to make it to Oasis. We'll wait and see, you know. Yet we, another you gotta, true event. You gotta, you gotta have another true event, <laughs> right? Um, Oh no, there's nothing else really at this point. You know, it's, it's one of those things where we've had the conversation in our household of like, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be a grind, Mm -hmm. um, you know, for at least a few more years before we can kind of feel like, yeah, we can start to Mm -hmm. reshift focus and get back to well, fun. On a a positive note, do you know what we did? We completely stayed away from uh, conspiracy theories. There we go. I mean, completely. We didn't even touch on any. Yeah. We had a long conversation at lunch around, uh, basically me but being like bro I'm so close to yeah. die. I mean I am on the edge of like I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious but we did have a, a really interesting conversation around Ozempic uh, pharmaceutical companies the educational system what else do we talk about that was diet I mean like uh, food uh, uh, food the, just the, everything sort of the industrial food complex yeah. um, see that that's a phrase that could tip us in there. It could. It could. Good. Medical, industrial, food complex, all of them. Well, you know what? Maybe that's a part two. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, man. So the only way I know to, to wrap these up is to do a cheers. Cheers. Um, listen, man, thanks for hanging out with us. You are, let me say this before we cheers. I, you, don't need, you don't need this, but you always give me good ideas. Oh, I know what I wanted to mention. Um, I'm so excited we are months away from Derek Wynn mowing season. Yes. Yeah. Um, because this is what happens, people. You must have a decent amount of yard to mow. Yep. Because you will send me messages after you mow of like, hey, I just had this idea. Like, is that, is that Oftentimes it's, it's, I'm still mowing. Oh, that's like, the, I'll stop. Okay. I'll, turn, I'll stop, you know, and, and maybe I'll turn it off depending on the idea and how long it's going to take. But yeah, I'll sit right there and text you and I'll go back to mowing again. I mean, so probably I'm going to, get directionally accurate let's say i've had six or seven good ideas this past year two or three of them are your ideas hey and i do give you props when i when yeah, we do I it you don't need to uh, so i'm super excited everybody in truth should be excited because when does mo like march or april yeah, maybe? i mean like april hmm, we're close yeah all right thanks cool. for coming thanks brother Appreciate it. thank you mm-hmm.